All right. Well, we're a little thin this morning. Jishel, bless you for being on the call. Appreciate you being on. Um, You're welcome. I'll I'll turn my video on in a minute. Okay, awesome. Uh, so listen, I have a few things to cover this morning, but I always like to start off with any wins, victories, or insights. So this is where you guys get to help me kick off the meeting. Otherwise, you're going to get something boring from me as a kickoff. So anything exciting happened in the past week? Any uh, victories, wins, contract insights, et cetera? Go, somebody. <laughs> you guys aren't playing nice. Come on now. Carrie, you had any victories lately? Okay. Well, okay. then you're going to Yes, yes, I do. All right. Let's hear it. Okay. So I represent a seller and um, some people that have been kind of around me, but wanting to be an unrepresented buyer came and wanted to see the house. So I showed them the house. In the end, they love it, wanted to be an unrepresented buyer and put in an offer. So in the process of discussing what it would look like to be an unrepresented buyer, it gave me the chance to tell them that many unrepresented buyers think that they will be able to just write the offer 3% less because there's not an agent representing that buyer. And I told them that that's not necessarily the case because during the listing discussion, the seller may very, very well have negotiated to cover an unrepresented buyer in the fees that the seller would be paying. And so then they did, they did, wouldn't necessarily be able to write a 3% less offer and be competitive. Yeah. And their eyes got really big. Yeah. And they asked him and they said, well, let us think about this. They called me back and said, we'd like you to represent us. <laughs> you so know, there you go. That's Carrie, maybe that, a good thing to put in the discussion we have. That is a good one. And I'm making a note for myself to um, do an addendum to our ER, ERS. I talked about it and I haven't done it yet. So I'm writing myself a note as we speak to do an addendum that covers additional fee uh, based on what's in 2.1 of the ERS if there's an unrepresented buyer, because everybody on this call knows you're still going to do work for the buyer, even if they're unrepresented. Yep. So that's such a good one, Carrie. I appreciate you. Can I drill down just for a second? So yeah. um, unfortunately, sometimes our, our buyer pool thinks they know more than they know. And I think it's a, a, a little bit, not terrible, but it's a little bit of a tricky dance to educate without offending. So did you find anything that was more or less successful, like in enlightening them, in the process of enlightening them? Words that I worked, just, phrases that worked or didn't work? Oh, well, I just said, I kind of was in the process of just educating them generally on how, how it all worked. And I think by just saying, you know, that something that the public, I think if you, if you say something that the public might not really understand is and yeah. that's when i that's when i told them about the unrepresented buyer commission that may already very well have been agreed upon by the seller but i think if i by saying the public does might not understand that's not offensive to them personally i i like that verbiage i like i've used in the past you know what 20 years ago i would have been thinking the same thing I mean, right? Just let that hang in the air for a minute. Did I really insult them by saying that? No, I don't think so. Have I opened the door that they might be missing an important fact? Yes, that's the whole point. So whether you use the public may not be aware or, man, I would have been thinking the same thing 20 years ago, right? And then come forward with, can I share with you what most people don't know? Right. Yeah, that sounds and, good. and man, you just pique their curiosity and you're asking a question, you're asking their permission. You know, they, what they don't realize is by doing that, you're, you're starting to rope them into the discussion, right? You, you made yeah. it okay for them to raise the issue. You didn't attack and be like, oh, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. You know, people don't realize, blah, blah, totally different approach, right? All of a sudden they're digging their heels in like, listen, I'm going to prove you wrong. So I like the approach and it's a good reminder for us. Make it collaborative and inclusive, that doesn't mean you have to be wishy-washy, 
you just have to use the right words, the right phraseology. Can I share with you something a lot of people don't know? Even the tone of how I say that, right, is enough for them to go, oh, crap, maybe I don't know what I think I know, right? Yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah. And if you handle it in a way that they, they're not having to bend their pride to come back to say, oh, okay, man. we'd like you to represent us. That's probably another thing to think about. I kind of joke about this, like in sales meetings and stuff. And I don't mean it as a derogatory term when I say it's like sometimes dealing with your teenage kids, if you've had teenage kids, right? You can be the authoritarian and that goes, oh, so well, all of us have been teenagers and we know how that went with us. Uh, or you can have like be the intelligent parent or have the intelligent parent who says, hey, Matt, can I share something with you? Right. Totally different tone. I just right off the bat. And so uh, I'm glad you brought that up. Fantastic. All right. Thank you. So um, I've had some interesting experiences myself this week. I'll just tell you one kind of trivial and then one that's going to segue into the first thing I wanted to cover. So uh, some stuff got reorganized in my neighborhood in relationship to church stuff, right, which uh, happens from time to time. And um ended up reconnecting with some people I knew years ago and as my wife and I were heading over to this thing I'm like you know what um there there's a guy there on on the neighborhood list I'm like I know this guy's name his name's Talon Webb I'm like how many Talon Webbs are there in the world probably not very many I'm like hell's bills I sold him and his wife a house like 15 16 years ago and sure enough we're at this little you know get together thing and this guy comes up and he's like, oh, my gosh, can't believe, you know, we're, we're connecting back after, you know, so many years. And uh, it was cool because one of the one of my neighbors, I, I shared this story earlier this year, uh, chose to list without me, which happens from time to time. And they didn't get their home sold for the record. And Talon's wife, like unsolicited, said, oh, my God. And this is in front of these people. Right. But, oh my gosh, we're so grateful that we used you as a realtor because there were so many problems with the builder and you totally stepped up and navigated this and we would have been totally lost if we hadn't used you as our realtor. I'm like, oh my gosh, I got to send these guys a certificate to Outback or something, you know, and you can just kind of read the other people and like, oh crap, maybe we should have used Barton and uh, they decide to stay for a while, so they're not going to be back in the market. But it just felt good, right? These are some of the uh, intrinsic rewards, mm -hmm. things that happen in our career. It felt good to know that somebody had a high degree of appreciation for helping shepherd them through, uh, you know, what, what was a little bit of a challenging transaction. Um, second experience was I was down in um, Arizona. Uh, last week for a couple of days and, and taking care of some business issues. Um, more to hear about that a little bit later on, uh, not on this call, but Ron will be sharing some information. But um, I had a call with one of our producing agents, high producing agents. And um, it was a reminder to me. So therefore I'm going to remind you that even agents inside our company or outside our company who think they have the whole national settlement thing figured out still apparently may need some help along the way. Um, one of the things that was said was, so it was a situation where um, the discussion kind of turned to the brokerage compensation. And I think the exact comment was, well, I've got to clean it up for video. There's no way I'm going to sign that effing document. That and he didn't say effing. Just for the record, that's a that's a quote from uh, Guardians of the Galaxy. If you remember that, right? Welcome to the. Do you guys remember this? Anybody watch Guardians of the Galaxy? Well, yeah, I, I love that movie. I don't remember that quote. Yeah, he says, "Welcome to the f the family." Although he didn't say, he said, "Welcome to the effing family," but he didn't say effing or something to that. Anyway, he said, "Fun family." Yeah, that's it. That was it. Yep, the fun family. Got so, it. anyway, you know, it it presented an opportunity to do, you know do some education, and of course, my question is, why not? Why would you not sign that? So, 
I'm going to turn it to you guys. And there's not a, just for the record, I'm, this is not a setup. Uh, the, the, the brokerage payment agreement can be helpful. And in some situations, it may not be. So I'm kind of curious, do you, would you agree with that? I'm not going to sign that document or are you more on the side of, yeah, sure, I'll sign it. And if so, why or why not? Uh-huh. Anyone? Matt, give us some more context about what what are you what are you even talking okay, about? Okay, so if you have Jashel, if you have a listing, right? And somebody says interested in either showing your house or I want to put in an offer, but I want to work out compensation ahead of time. So I'm gonna send over the brokerage payment agreement, the broker to broker payment agreement. Would you sign that or would you say, yeah, I, I need to wait till I see the offer? Well, you have to be Absolutely. really careful that you don't end up obligating your um, seller to pay compensation from the, the the first agreement they send over and then also in the REPC. Good point, Carrie. Jashelle? I think it probably makes more sense to look at the offer, but also I... In my mind, I would be, if I had any question about it, I'd be like, I'm going to have my broker look at this with me. Hey, there's a good idea. Dan would be happy to help. And if he can't help, I'm there to help or Julie or Neil or anybody. Um, I don't have this. I don't have a straight up answer like, yes, I'm going to do it one way or another because there are 75 different ways that for that document to tell me what's going to happen in the, in the transaction. So no, I'm not going to just right off the bat say, sure, I'll sign that. Fair point. I, I don't disagree. Um, sometimes it makes sense. I'll just, I'm going to segue for two seconds. I got a, a call from one of our agents up in South Ogden last night. And she's like, listen, my buyer wants to put an offer in and the agent and the broker are being non-responsive to a brokerage payment agreement. What do I do? I'm like, well, it's not the most ideal, but we should never get in the way. Our compensation should never get in the way of what our clients is trying to accomplish acquire a contractual interest in the property. I said, so although it's not ideal, then in this case, put the compensation in the REPSI. That way you're forcing them to address it, right? If they're not going to be pros and 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 deal with it the way you initially want to talk about it, then force it to the REPSI. You, you potentially maybe lose a little leverage by doing that. Maybe, maybe not. But I get I guarantee you this, they have to present the offer to the seller and compensation is now in fact going to be discussed. So to your point, Michelle, it depends on the situation. But I want to come back to my scenario because I think it's important for us to understand. What I've talked about over the past two months is there's, there's literally two pathways. There's probably more, but predominantly there's two pathways for compensation. One is through the brokerage compensation agreement. And just to be Captain Obvious here and explain this, that is a contract from one broker to another broker to agree to pay compensation if a rep if a REPC is accepted versus in the REPC if we deal with compensation it's the seller agreeing to pay the buyer's brokerage directly it's essentially for, for all practical purposes it's bypassing the ERS right and so the interesting discussion that I had with this agent last week was when he said I'm, I'm never going to sign that effing document if somebody sends it over and I, my question was, well, why not? Because I'm always curious as to what people's rationale is. And you know what? When I asked that very simple question, there wasn't a very um, concise, well thought out answer. It was kind of like, well, I don't want to be on the hook. I'm like, have you read the document? Hey, man. That's that's a, oh by the way if you ever call me with something like that that's going to be one of my go tos is have you actually read the document yes Don to me and maybe I misunderstand it to me it almost seems like that negotiation up front is a moot point because the repsy could I mean it could be a terrible offer and you come back with well no I'm not going to pay three percent I'm only going to pay one percent at this offer so it seems like it's almost unnecessary until you actually see the offer. So I don't disagree with you, Don, and, and the scenario I used with this agent who, who plays typically in a little higher price point, I said, listen, if you had a house listed for $2 million 
and I'm sending over a brokerage compensation agreement, let's start with this. Is it is it my prerogative as an agent to say, yeah, that's not going to work for me. It's not going to be the deal that my seller wants. Or almost always is it my seller's place to make that determination, right? And that's a little bit of a rhetorical question. We're not, it, it, like, you probably all have this experience where you counter something to an agent and they say, yeah, my, my seller's not going to accept that. I mean, like, you just sent it to them or you just shared it with them. I'm like, have you even talked to your client yet? Because you have a fiduciary to share that unless you have written instructions saying to the contrary. So I just want to remind us that it's not our prerogative to make the decisions for our sellers. So what I want to do is go back really quickly on this particular question. If you go to the, um, let me share my screen. I know you guys have all been waiting for me to share my screen. Yeah, there was going to be my starting point. We may come back to that. Um, PDFs up here. Okay, so I'm going to open. Uh, okay, clients. Okay. So um, let's grab this. Oh, I didn't actually want to see. Dang it, I wanted the ERS, sorry. Okay, so in the ERS, right, which I have on screen and I'll make it a little bigger so we can all see this and don't worry about all the annotations. But basically, if, if, if a quick rehearsal of this, Section one is how much is the listing brokerage going to be paid in the absence of limited agency or any other addendum? How much is the listing brokerage going to be paid? Everybody's clear with that one, right? That's not that's not a tough concept. Um, and so where where people start to get a little confused, especially when situations are unique situations are brought up, is well, what does 2.2 and 2.3 mean? And remember. 2.2, just like the title says, it's authorization for us as the buyer's brokerage to, not the buyer, at the listing brokerage to offer compensation to the buyer's brokerage. So this is a potentially obligating paragraph to the seller, but it does give us specific authority to offer compensation, okay? And what it says here is that the company's authorized to advertise or otherwise communicate that the seller and or the company is offering compensation. Why and or in this document? Why and or? Any idea, Parker? I'll future face you. It's, it's because if you use it through this agreement, it's the, the company is going to communicate. If it's through a repsy, then it's going to be from the seller. So that's why the and or nature of this line. Anyway, it goes on to say that we're both allowed to authorize or have been authorized to communicate compensation up to an amount of X percent, right? And that's super clear, but it's still not exactly binding to the seller yet. What is missing? Well, what's missing is in 2.3. And it says the compensation agreement between the company and the buyer's brokerage, right? In the event, this is the hurdle that has to be jumped to where this be, what's in section 2.2 actually becomes an obligation. In the event, the company agrees in a written compensation agreement, also known as this document, uh, to the buyer's brokerage, the seller then agrees that that additional amount will be added to what's in 2.1. You with me? So without a written compensation agreement, the only thing a seller is obligated to pay the listing brokerage is what's in 2.1, okay? So now the part that's not actually written here that should be implied, but I think some people are missing is, so going back to my scenario, a $2 million listing, uh, and Jashel, you, you uh, want to put in an offer, but you've done some comps and it's looks like it's more like 1.8 million. 
by your comps and you say, Matt, uh, I want to show the home, but I want to make sure compensation is worked out ahead of time. I'm going to send over this broker to broker compensation agreement. If you can sign that, we'll show it. I'm pretty sure we're going to put an offer in. And of course, me being a good agent, I'm going to say something like, well, that's cool. And we will agree to it. But I just want a future pace you to show by signing it. It's all going to depend on the offer. My seller wants to sell this at $2 million. They think it's worth $2 million. So if you have an offer that comes in low, I'm probably going to come back at you with a different compensation agreement, not for the full 3% that I'm currently authorized to do in 2.2. 2. The seller has told me if it comes in below a certain amount, then we're going to advise, uh, revise compensation. Fair enough. And Jashel says, cool. So. Cool. Cool. And yeah, just like that. That's how she said it. Um, so if, if she sends over an offer and we don't counter it, and we just accept it, then yes, the brokerage and by extension, eventually back to the seller is obligated to what we agreed to in the compensation agreement, 3%. But if, if my seller says, yeah, Matt, uh, I wasn't kidding. Uh, we really think it's worth 2 million. I'm not super excited to pay 3% on 1.8, which is taking us backwards. You know, uh, what if we were to take the compensation down to one and a half percent? Can the seller do that? Yeah, because they haven't signed a REPSI yet. They're not obligated to what's in this agreement until a REPSI is signed. This is all just future pace, right? Where could this end up landing if if the right offer is put in? So in that case, I would turn around to Jashelle and be like, hey, Jashelle, um, appreciate the offer. I really do. Um, I'm, I'm happy to share with you some comps where we think the price is really closer to $2 million. But if your buyers are insistent at coming in at 1.8 million before we accept that offer, I'm going to send you a, a, a brokerage compensation agreement that reflects one and a half percent. Are you okay with that? You know what? Who knows? She may be okay with it. You know, um, you know, a forty-five thousand uh, dollar or what is that? Two million? Uh, uh, a thirty thousand dollar commission check? Not a bad day. Uh, and she may just say, "Cool, great, let's do it." But it just still keeps it in that realm of negotiation. The forcing function that people, because it's not written in the actual agreement, the 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 safety net is an accepted repsy. Until a repsy is accepted, none of this applies. Dan. So uh, let's see. One, it, it, the DOJ seems to be on a path of getting rid of broker to broker compensation, generally speaking. And maybe we don't need to have that conversation today, but yeah, there's a lot but, of graph. There's a lot of trail to go down before that becomes a thing. So, so the in contemplation form is broker to broker. Right. Yep. And then the repsy is if they write in four, three, that is seller to buyer. Seller to buyer's brokerage. Th right through the, Right. Through closing the through the buyer's brokerage, right? Yep. So, you know, again, and we keep hitting on this, but like if we do the in contemplation broker to broker agreement and there is an additional compensation agreed to in the repsy, we could be doubling up on compensation offered from seller to buyer. Um, so that, you know, just a, a, a see what or a, a reminder just to make sure that we're watching for the in addition to, uh, portions of the addendums and other agreement, uh, other forms of uh, compensation. For sure. For sure. And since we're talking about this, I want to bring it up on screen. Notice that I, I have this in red. You don't have to fill out section 4.3E. This is a, this, I, I'm bringing this up because this is a legitimate confusion by many of your peers out in the industry. They think even if they have a brokerage compensation agreement, they still need to put the compensation in the REPSI. The language in this section makes it very clear. You can not fill out this section and everything's okay. All right. So let's start there. You don't have to fill this out. That's why they put if no box is checked. <laughs> That's implied it's okay to not have any uh, box checked, meaning compensation in the form of a flat dollar amount or a percentage. But to Dan's point, this payment, if it is checked, shall be made in addition to any other compensation agreed to by the uh, seller's uh, brokerage to the buyer's brokerage. So it's 
it's saying, hey, listen, if you have a buyer agency agreement that says 4%, I'm going to use this for to demonstrate the purpose, uh, uh, demonstrate the, the issue at hand here. Um, if you sent over a broker-to-broker -broker compensation agreement for 3% and we accept your REPSI, and oh, by the way, in the REPSI, it says 3% because the agent didn't know what was going on. How much is the seller obligated to pay at that point? I I I I, I teased you with you can't be. Uh, this is what should be connecting in your mind. You can't be paid more than is in your buyer broker agreement. So even though there's three percent via broker to broker and three percent via the repsi, which together makes six percent. It doesn't matter. The maximum amount you can be paid is what's in your buyer broker. So in that case, it would be 4%. But that's that's avoiding the bigger issue, which is, you know, you should have gone back before allowing your seller to sign that repsy and say, hey, we already have a compensation agreement for 3%, which is what you authorized me to do, right, uh, in, in the ERS. I don't want to put you in jeopardy or a conflict or even the possibility for a fight. So let's counter back the buyer's agent saying the information uh, in section 4.3 E to be 0%, zero dollars. That way we're back to 3%, right? That, it sounds like a lot of moving parts, but when you do this more than five or six times, all of a sudden you're like, yeah, this is actually super easy to navigate but it does require us to pay a little extra attention to Dan's point. Andy. Yeah, so I have a couple of things on there that I'm thinking. Um, one is I've had the experience where I've been dealing with really busy agents and they've not really read their contracts. And this is years and years ago. Um, I think Oh, it's true today too, Andy, just for the record. Oh, I, and and I agree. Okay. And that's my point yeah. is that I think that this is going to bite a bunch of agents who are really busy in the butt. And that are going to have signed this because for me i don't send the pre-negotiation and i'll explain why in just a second but um that have signed the pre-negotiation on it and then put it in the rep seat and then the listing agent is going to be eating their commission and completely because they're going to be paying the buyer's agent double commission because you're going to have a hard time convincing your client your seller that they're responsible for two commissions um to the buyer's agent i think you're yeah. going to see that you you and, have a gift you have a gift for understatement, Andy. Yeah, we're, we're going to see a lot of that. I think yeah. happen, and I think that that document's going to end up going away because of that. But secondly, the reason I don't see it is more to your point of of I'm not going to let my commission get in the way of getting the contract done. So I'm not going to wait to show the house if they haven't signed this before I send it. Sure, I can send it. If they don't sign it, though, I'm not waiting to schedule my showing. I'm just going to put it into my contract. And that's why I haven't used it. It's because I'm not going to slow down my process. Okay, so let me ask that. you a question. Forget getting it before showing. I think that's the examples I've used in the past is if you're worried about, um, you know, a multi-million dollar property where it could be problematic. But would, do you see a problem with sending this over before sending a repsy? No. Okay. Because it's, 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 repsies don't take a ton of time to write. Right. Um, so I think it may actually take more time for me to write this, communicate with them, call them, say, hey, I need to get this signed before I'll send over my offer. If I just send over the offer, they have to present it. They have to show it. They can't say, we're not going to sign this, and therefore I don't have to sign it to my client. Right. So, you know, actually, this is kind of an interesting thing. If you think about negotiations, if I send this over in advance and I use the right language, um, it's actually a little bit of a tell from the seller side. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, and so I see some advantages to this, but I want to come back to, to the example I was using with this agent. Who started off by saying i'm not going to have them sign that effing agreement I, i'm going to rapid fire my points because we need to move on but it's like one you have a fiduciary to your client it's not your call right if an agent sends this over and you've been authorized right if you've been authorized in the ers saying yes 
I have not only the authority to advertise the amount, but I can also sign an agreement that will obligate my seller. So this is in the category, uh, not just fiduciary, but um, when, when we are given permissions, sometimes they transform into actual obligations. They're not just um, a nicety that um, we, we may or may not do. So the example I've used in the past was when we had a, a, a lawsuit years ago um, where in our contract it said that we can do certain things and the client made the case that since we said we can and they were remote, that we actually had an obligation. It's called implied duties is the contractual term. So here we have a contract that says, I, the seller, am giving you, Andy, permission up to a certain amount so that the contractual terms are clear so that if somebody comes you have the right right to to obligate as long as it doesn't exceed this amount and i would take that a step further and say you actually have implied duties to do it not just well it's not you know we let our ego get in the way and we make a decision for our seller that kind of contract contradicts what we've already been um, authorized to do. So be careful with that. So coming back to th this agent, I said, why in the world would you not? And of course, there are some scenarios where you may not. But as a general rule, now that we know the safety net is a REPSI, I'm going to cast as big a net as possible. We all understand the value of this, right? The more offers, the higher the price tends to go. So knowing that up until the time my seller accepts a REPSI, which I'm going to be there with them, and tell them, yes, we actually signed with this particular offer that they would pay 3%, that you, the seller, would pay 3% via your relationship with me as the listing broker. Um, we need to make sure that the rep sees exactly what you want in order to pay that. And if not, we'll go back at them with something less, or we'll get them to raise the price to where we need it to be. This is the game. So my, my advice to the agent was, if you're going to do best by your clients and frankly get people who repeat and refer and do what's in their best interest, then I would highly suggest you inform them of this in advance. Be like, hey, Andy, just so you know, as my seller, the new lay of the land is this. They can put it in the REPSI, and I'm going to explain to you why there's some downsides to that, meaning us, this group. But if I get a broker compensation agreement, and as long as it doesn't exceed what's in 2.2, I'm going to go ahead and sign this because I want to get as many offers for you as possible, Andy. Fair enough. What is Andy going to say? No, I don't want more offers. I want fewer. Right? It's stupid. It's a, it's a dumb rhetorical question. But I'm also going to take the opportunity to be like, but here's the thing, Andy. You're always in control up until the time we sign a REPSI and then I explain the process, right, of how we may counter back and forth and, and protect his interests. So... Don't be afraid of the broker-to-broker -broker compensation agreement because it's very well articulated in the ERS and there is an absolute safety net for your sellers and for you before it becomes contractually ob obligatory. Yep, big word of the day, obligatory. Okay, now I, I kind of did a teaser with this and it goes to Gishel's point. It depends on the situation. Um, I, I shared this in my broker minute or two. I wanted to touch on it on this call. One of the unforeseen things as we implemented this national settlement and the forms came about last week for me. I was at a, uh, sorry, the week before I was at an arbitration hearing up at the Salt Lake board. And the issue was the seller did not end up paying what was required in the REPC. So in section 4.3e, right, the seller had committed to more than more than what the uh, the listing brokerage was going to pay. The listing brokerage was going to pay one percent, and they did pay that. And as part of the negotiations, when they when the buyer's brokerage sent over a repsy, um, um they put in an additional one and a half percent. And it was on a, you know, it was on a $1.3 million property. And when the settlement came, the seller just said, screw it. I'm not paying. What's in the REPSI? 
So here's the question for y'all. How do you get that money that is owed to the buyer's brokerage? And who's responsible to get that money, if anybody's going to get it at all? Come on, you guys. Isn't it a titles? I mean, they, they're supposed to withhold the money from the seller's proceeds? <laughs> yeah, they're supposed to, Dan. And guess what? Title. Not all title companies are created equally. Um, the point being is the seller, if you look at this language, he is the one, not the listing brokerage, right? This, the compensation is going to come directly from the seller to the buyer's brokerage. So the buyer's brokerage has to sue the seller directly. There you through. go. If he's yeah. intractable and everybody closes because they don't want commission compensation to get in the way of a transaction, uh, you can't go to the listing brokerage and say, hey, your seller didn't pay what they were supposed to because the, the listing brokerage said, not my contract. My contract was for 1%. I paid your brokerage the 1% that was owed. That's the contract I have. If you want the additional 1.5%, you got to go after the seller. So this is my caution to you guys. I'm not saying it's not the right tool to be used, but just go in with eyes wide open. If a seller gets squirrely and doesn't want to pay this, and then all of a sudden the transaction is being held hostage, and I think we will see some more of this, right? You can imagine the scenario where during the course of the transaction, you know, the buyer brings up, oh, the roof needs repaired and the seller pays $5,000 repairing the roof and this, that, or a sewer lateral or this, that, the other. And all of a sudden the seller gets to the closing table like, I'm not paying that one and a half percent. I, I paid $30,000 more than I planned to on this transaction. Is that at least possible, feasible for a seller to think that? Yeah, it's going to happen more and more. And so just know if you're representing your buyer, don't be too cavalier or too quick to use what's in the repsy, right? Because that situation could arise. And at that point, you're going to come to me as the principal broker and be like, hey, Matt, I'm owed commission on this via the repsy. But unfortunately, we have to go sue the seller. I love it when they say we have to go sue the seller. And he's hey, Matt. Yes, Parker. I I won't come to you. I'll, I'll go to Dan. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, here's the interesting thing. You as an agent cannot sue a client. You all know that, right? It's only the brokerage that can sue. And so we're going to come back to you, Parker, and be like, totally get it. Um, hopefully it's under 15000 which means we can handle it in small claims. It's over 15000 we got to go to district court, which is a long process and more expensive. And by the way, you know, we're probably going to arrange this, I mean, uh, based on your split. So if you're on 85-15, you get, you get to carry 85% of the legal costs. We'll carry our 15%. And if we win, you get your 85%, we get our 15%. And for a lot of agents, that's going to be like, well, crap. What do you mean? I'm like, well, you know, it's got to be reflective of what our relationship is. We're not going to go carry 100% of the, co the cost to go sue somebody and then give up 85% of the money without you participating. I so Matt, are you saying that the title company is not responsible for collecting the money if it's in the rep seat, but they are responsible for collecting the money if it's in the other contract? So responsible is an interesting term. I mean, when you talk about a title company, they're supposed to take what's in the agreement or agreements and correctly reflect them on the settlement statement but they don't have any forcing power. They're not a policing entity. They can't make anybody do anything. So in this situation, they basically went to both parties, right? Everybody signed and then this kind of hit the fan and it hadn't closed yet. And the seller quite literally said, screw it. If they want to sue me for specific performance, game on, let's go. And so, so that could happen no matter what, whether you're using the reps or the other form then at that point, right? Correct, correct. But the difference between the REPSI in this form is if we have the broker-to-broker uh, -broker compensation agreement, all we have to do is turn around to the listing brokerage and say, you have a contract with us to pay the amount. How you get it, I don't care. Now they get to be the party that sues their seller for the missing funds, not us. That's the distinction I want to make. 
If you use the broker-to-broker -broker compensation agreement, the listing brokerage has to do the chasing. If you use the REPC and something goes squirrely, we have to do the legal chasing. That's the big difference there. But, but Matt, don't don't buyer brokers brokerages have to sue listing brokerages all the time to get commission? No, so it's a great point, Haley. Um, in this case, I sat down with the attorneys afterwards and I said, the fact that we now have language in the REPC that um, tangentially brings the buyer's brokerage into the agreement as an obligation for the seller to pay the buyer's brokerage, the buyer's brokerage now has standing. So they don't sue the listing brokerage. The agreement in the REPC is between the buyer's brokerage and the seller. The buyer's brokerage does have standing by the way it's written in the contract. And so the buyer's brokerage would have to sue the seller. But I mean, with with the the buyer compens the brokerage compensation agreement. I mean, those don't always work with just the True. the listing broker doesn't just hand over the money. There are a lot of lawsuits in those those cases as well. For sure, and I'm not I'm not pretending for a minute that this is a silver bullet solves all the problems. I'm just saying, rather than somebody having to cough up fifteen, twenty, thirty thousand dollars to sue somebody in district court, it's no longer us. We turned around to the uh, listing brokers and said, you signed a contract with our brokerage that if we close the deal, you're, you, not the seller, you are going to pay us. And you didn't. So you either pay us or you go back to your seller and ask them very nicely or directly. And if they won't do it, then you get to sue them for the missing commissions on your contract, which is your ERS. So it doesn't, it doesn't change the fact that the seller is still intractable. It just changes who's responsible to sue the seller when they don't pay us or the listing brokerage. Make sense? Um, so the backlog right now for the criminal or for the, for the district court system in Utah is anywhere yep. between six months to three years, depending on the case. It and fluctuates that, and, it, and, that, and it depends on where you file. They're saying that includes virtual that includes virtual hearings. So there's yeah. a that's insane. That's this is insane. my this is my point, Parker. So let's say it was on a three million dollar property and there was a three percent that was supposed to be paid by the seller via the REPC. There's ninety thousand dollars in play, right? You we as the buyer's brokerage, if it's in the REPC, can go pursue that. And yes, we're gonna be in district court. We're four to six months out on average. And the, the, the cost to file are in excess of $3,000 just to file. And your first hearing, which is an introduction of everybody, you know, is four to six months out. And then you get to go through depositions and then you get to go through all the discovery phase and all that stuff. And then you actually get to a hearing. So this is a big mess. And I'm, I'm trying to tell you guys this. So if you, as the buyer's agent and your brokerage are okay with that, then by all means, just keep it in the rep seat. If you want to make that big ball of mess, the listing brokerage's responsibility, right? And yes, it's still going to take a while for you to get paid, but they have a contract with us that says they're obligated to pay us if a rep C was signed. Then they have to go that whole route with their seller. Now, listen, if I was that listing agent at that point or listing broker at that point, I'd be having a very frank conversation with my seller. I'm like, listen, we did our job for you. We got a rep C that you voluntarily signed. And I'd probably do this with an attorney backing, you know, probably saying this authoritatively. And oh, by the way, your ERS is very clear that if any of this gets litigated and we have to have attorneys in place, you're going to catch all the fees as well. So your $90,000 is probably going to end up looking more like something like $210,000, $220,000. Not trying to be a jerk here. But I'm just trying to tell you where this is going if you're in transient, right? I would rather have the listing brokerage have to do that than me as the buyer's brokerage. That's all I'm trying to say. So just understand there's a trade-off both ways. If you want that additional protection, then get a, a, a brokerage compensation agreement in place before the rep C signing. If you don't care, you're willing to roll the dice and you know the commission's less than 15,000 and figure, oh, we can handle it in small claims, which is easier. Still not easy, but it's easier. Well, then by all means, just do it in the rep C. Okay. All right. Way too much time on that because I have a few more things to, to cover with you guys, but that's a good discussion, right? I mean, you need to be aware of the trade-offs and there are trade-offs and it does depend on the situation. All right. 
Having said that, let me move to this. Um, you guys aware of the new ownership fields on the MLS? Have you seen that, the announcement for that? And it has, you know, whether it's an REO owned property or whether it's a trust or an LLC or a fractional ownership. Why do you think they created those fields in the MLS? Just a Because it, it was a pain in the butt to always go to the remarks. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's that. I'd be surprised. <laughs> Or is it possible that the MLS realized that when they said ownership and allowed people to put things in that weren't ownership, the correct ownership, that uh, they're potentially taking on risk, right? And it's something we've talked about over the years, so this is just a gentle reminder. Yes, make sure you put, if it's an LLC or a trust, so that you get an offer with the appropriate buyer or seller names and that they're signed the appropriate way. So here's the trivia question. If it's the Barton Trust, and I am the trustee, Matt Barton, how should I sign? Come on, anyone. Uh, you should sign, I think you sign as the principal, don't you? Principal of the trust? No, trustee. Trustee. Oh, trustee. Matt, Matt Barton, trustee, comma, Matt Bart or the Barton Trust. Okay? Mm -hmm. What if it is the, what if it's the Barton LLC? How do I sign? Say it again, Parker, you had it right for this one. Uh, you just say your name and then principal of the LLC. You can say principal, you can say partner, Yeah. Uh, you know, anything that designates your power. And here's the important part to remember you guys, this isn't us as a company or the state or the title company, by the way, the title company is gonna have them sign this way too, so that it's legally effective. Even though I'm the trustee for the Barton Trust, and even though I'm the president of Barton Building Realty Co., I'm my only, they are their own legal person, as I, am I. It would be the equivalent, Parker, of me signing a contract for you and signing Matt Barton. It's like, well, Parker's, Parker's the buyer, not Matt Barton. Well, it's the same thing. Even though I own those entities, you have to sign it a certain way so that it reflects the actual legal person that is doing the signing. And so when we, we sign an offer or as a seller or a buyer or a trust, tr the name of the trustee, what their title is, trustee, comma, the name of the trust. Back does that change with, how, do, how does that change with fractional ownership? I've never seen a signature yeah. on so fractional I, ownership. I would probably do a different class on this, but I'll just tell you really quickly. So down in St. George is where this is most common. We see a little bit of it in Park City. So there's companies out there that are going in and building relatively expensive properties. And part of their marketing shtick is you only have to buy an eighth of a ownership, right? One eighth. So it becomes very cost effective. It's a good model. There's nothing wrong with it. But the way most of them handle it is the owner of the property is an LLC. Okay. And so really what you're buying is a portion of ownership of the LLC Yeah. because the property doesn't change hands. It's still held in the name of the LLC. And so really your, your, your transaction, even though you're getting access to a property and frankly, just to be perfectly honest, Parker, uh, DRE, UAR really needs to get this figured out because they've kind of left us in a little bit of a land of lurch of grayness because we're not actually transferring ownership of a property. We're transferring ownership in an LLC who happens to own a property. And there is a significant difference on that. So I would say this, if you, if you bump into fractional ownership, let's have a conversation on, on how to proceed because it's far from a hundred percent clear right now. Okay. Sure. All right. Um, so yeah, just be aware of that. That is a new field. When you fill out um, the MLS forms, if it's an LLC or a trust, make sure you tag it appropriately. And you may want to put in the remarks uh, if somebody's going to drop into a digital signature, the name for your your client. Maybe spell out in the remarks of who it is. Matt Barton, trustee Barton Trust. Okay. Having said that, next thing: cancellation of an ERS. Seems so mundane, right? Seems like we should not even have to discuss this. But we get this all the time uh, it, it, at the office. Why are you requiring me to send in a cancellation? The seller just doesn't want to sell anymore. 
Remember that phrase I was using about implied duties? There's a contract in place. It's between the, the, the seller and the brokerage and by extension, you as the listing agent. And if we just think we can just let it right off into the sunset and everything's okay and you stop doing what you're supposed to do, we create liability because we have implied duties. So we actually have explicit duties <laughs> in the ERS and we also have implied duties. And so, yes, oh, that's not the form I wanted, dang it. You know, I thought I had this all set up. Anyway, we will come to this one here in a second. Just know that there is a cancellation form, the seller's um, notice of cancellation. It's actually pretty clean. I like it. Um, be aware that your protection period that a lot of agents put a lot of faith in is very restricted in what it actually protects. If, yeah. Dan's, if Dan's my listing agent and he says, yeah, I no longer want to work with you and I'm sitting there feeling all good about myself. I'm like, well, I got a 12 month protection period with Dan. Um, so I'm going to, you know, uh, do a cancellation, but the, the protection period is still in place. Do you, do you have a copy of this form? I do. Do you want Matt, me to so quick question to you on section two, it says both parties agree to mutually release each other from any and all obligations, claims, liability, and demands arising out of the agreement, including, but not limited to the agreement's protection period, unless checked below. Now, having said that, this is both parties. So let's say I'm selling a property and all of a sudden my seller sends me over a cancellation and says, well, I've sent this cancellation over. I, 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 I want to get out of this. If I don't sign this or, or excuse me, if the broker doesn't sign this or the broker doesn't sign this, then this agreement is not canceled. Correct. Yeah, you, can't, okay. you, you cannot unilaterally cancel a bilateral contract. That's not the way it works. Yeah. <laughs> there has to be a meeting of the minds for anything contractual, right? It didn't used to be that way though, right? Didn't it used to be just, we're canceling? Nope. Oh, it was always an agreement? Okay. Always been a bilateral agreement, right? So I'm going to bring this up. Um, all right. I share my screen one more time so we can see this. Sorry, I thought I had it ready to go screen. Okay, so here it is, right? It seems very straightforward. Obviously, the obligatory uh, information at the front end. Oh, pulled up the wrong one. Damn it. Hold on. Matt, you want me to share my screen? I got it pulled up. Parker, shut up. <laughs> uh, where am I here? I just had it. Let's go. Why am I drawing a blank here? Isn't there right there the third one down from the top? Scroll up. Yep, that's there it. There we go. Yeah, why did they name it that, Dan? I don't know. Okay, so very straightforward, right? Here's the listing between the parties. You know, what was its date? It's a mutual termination. Notice you do have a checkbox here. Uh, are you getting rid of the protection period, right? Or not? Now, I'm going to stop there for a second. Realize this. The only protection you're getting by that protection period is if they don't go list with another brokerage. If they go list with another brokerage, your protection period is done. Yeah. So it's only in the case as an example of, well, we have one of the buyers circle back and they said, if your listing's gone, then we'll come back and buy it because we won't have to pay a commission and blah, 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 blah. It, it would protect in that situation. But if, if, you know, Presidio or somebody came behind you and said, hey, you know, we could probably do a better job, which is a lot. But if they if they said something like that, it'd be inappropriate, but it does happen from time to time. And your seller canceled and they turned around and listed with Presidio, then you have no protection period. I just hope that's 100% clear to you guys. It literally says that in the listing agreement, the UAR listing agreement. And the same is true for your buyer broker agreement. I told the uh, the attorneys at UAR they need to relabel these sections as the very limited protection period <laughs> because it does very little. So my point is you may want to spend a little time here, 
rather than your protection period, if you want, if you want to exit, uh, and, and they're not mutually exclusive, right? I could check this box here, right? And put a dollar amount here. Uh, I want money for the, the drone footage that I paid for, for staging, for whatever we've done, right? Uh, have a mover come declutter your house. Uh, if you really want out of the agreement, you're going to pay this amount. And until it's paid, this agreement, or, or until you sign off on that, this agreement is not terminated. So I only bring this up because we get, as TCs and office managers, blank addenda to the ERS saying the listing is canceled. And then we get a call later on from our agent like, you won't believe what the seller just did. I'm like, oh, I can guess. I can guess. <laughs> Maybe next time use the form to help walk you through some of the eventualities and how we're going to handle those. Okay. Everybody good with that? Because I'm closing in on the end here. Um, the last thing I wanted to cover with you guys, by the way, does everybody know the MLS statuses? Because we get this question a lot too. Um, that was in my, here we go. Uh, really quickly on these, I'm not going to spend a lot of time. Active, active TC. I get this all the time. Well, my my seller still wants to market it. Can you do that? Yes, but you can't put. If you've accepted an offer, even with the time clause and all that, you must put it either as an active TC status or a backup status. And there's two key distinctions between these. This one, right, time clause addendum is in place. And on this one, it's like there is no time clause. There's no kickout provision to get whoever's in first position out of first position. We're just interested to see if anybody would put in a backup offer in case our deal falls through. So that's the difference between active TC and backup. And then the other question I get a lot is what is it, um, by the way, active no-show is the off-market. It's only a temporary designation. The good news is days on market do not accumulate. We're in that status. Like if they're gone on vacation for two weeks and they don't want showings while they're gone, this would be your status. The last two or three are the ones that seem to be most confusing with people. And it's like, okay, what does withdrawn mean? Well, it means we withdrew marketing it, but we still have a valid listing agreement. So don't call and ask if they want to list. Okay. Canceled, the listing agreement has been terminated. For those of you who've been in the business long enough, this is the unconditional withdrawal. It's the, effectively the same thing. And the last one is they just ran out the clock, right? They they were good through December 1st. It's now December 2nd. It's expired. So don't don't be confused on the terms, okay? All right, now the last thing. Um, the HOA, how many of you have ever had to deal with an HOA that didn't exactly cooperate uh, in getting you documentation. Come on. We're all recovering HOA addicts. Uh, <laughs> did you know that there is an HOA form? Yes. And I would highly, highly recommend you do this. Tell, so listen, if you're the listing agent representing your seller under your fiduciary of reasonable care, you have everything that is in section seven in seller's disclosures. It's not just the document. That's only item A. <laughs> you have everything else, right? Co uh, copies of the CCNRs, most recent minutes, budget, financial statement. And if you do not, if your seller does not provide these things by the seller's disclosures deadline, it is a material breach of the contract, meaning it will stand up in court. Okay. So having said that, this form is super helpful. Why? Hey, Matt. Yes. Uh, I, and I know that we're short on time here, but Dan and I came across something like this earlier this week. If you go back to the seller disclosures, let's just say the seller doesn't get me the CCNRs in time. Yep. Per the, per this, per the seller disclosure deadline. Is that something that I can utilize to back out of the contract or sorry, that my buyer can use to back out of the contract if they so decide, you know, I don't know two days before closing. Well, okay. So I was okay with up until you said two days bef before closing. Right. right. If if they said they're going to provide you seller's disclosures, and remember items A through L are collectively referred to as seller's disclosures. Everything that's in there. So in, in your example, CC&Rs. If 
it's a day after seller disclosures deadline, cancel. 100% justified. Three days, five days, a reasonable period of time, I would say absolutely, right? But if you continue on, let's say you then go do an appraisal and you have a home inspector come out after the deadline and you continue to act as if you're in agreement with the contract, you've created an opening for an attorney to argue that you were agreeable with the fact that the CCNRs were not provided. Uh, it's far, That's what me and Dan decided, but I was just I'm, It's uh, far from a clear-cut legal case, but I would say for a reasonable period of time, and it depends on the contract, uh, what reasonable is, you can use this as a cancellation, right? Yeah. But you can't go uh, three, four weeks down the road and five minutes before closing say, well, you didn't do this, and therefore now I'm canceling and I'm going after the remedies in Section 16. You can do that whether you're successful becomes highly suspect. Okay. So yeah, hopefully that answers your question. But back back to this form. Um, I like the fact that right up front it's stating what the Utah code is. So for the idiot HOA, the few, the very few idiot HOA managers out there who don't understand what the Utah law is, it actually gives them the section of code and tells them what their obligations are, what the time frame is what they're to provide. So rather than hoping they understand everything they need, you can check the boxes down here as to what they are to provide, how they, by law, how they are supposed to do it. And oh, by the way, if it's the seller requesting, they can't charge. Let me say that again. If it's the seller, oh, that's interesting. If it's the seller requesting, they cannot charge. If it's you as their agent asking for the info, they can charge. And that is also covered down in section three. What is the maximum amount that they can charge, right? And here's the point. I think section four is the, the, the stick. It's no longer the carrot. It's the stick. If you fail to provide this and you're giving them notice, you can be liable for $25 a day starting on the sixth day, right? And that goes on in perpetuity. That doesn't have like a cutoff at you know $10,000. It just keeps going and going and going. And then the last one, is the big stick, which is, by the way, if we have to engage an attorney to get this, you're actually going to catch their costs as well as the $25 a day, right? Now, just like we started off with, if you're trying to tell a teenage kid, the last thing you want to do is be like, if you don't do this, and you know, you're probably not going to get a lot of transactions. So, Parker, if you're the HOA uh, uh, representative, I'm going to call you up and be like, hey, Parker, listen, uh, you know, the Joneses, well, you got them under contract. I don't know if you're aware. Please don't be offended by this when I send this over, but it's a form that UAR has used for quite some time now because a lot of HOAs, probably not yours, don't understand their obligations. And it just spells it out very clearly what we're looking for, what the state code is, and what the, the potential for damages are if, if they're not provided. Are you okay with me sending that over? I'm going to send it over whether they say yes or no, but I'm trying to be collaborative with them at the front end versus starting with just trading punches, right? You, you tend to get a little more traction that way. But just know, don't don't try and do it all yourself, right? Don't just say, well, I tried calling the HOA. That's not sufficient. This creates a paper trail where, where it was very clear what they needed to do. And one last thing before we wrap up on this is a lot of times um, agents are confused on some of the requirements uh, for this. So right in section seven, opening sentence, right? And it's really more this right here. Seller shall provide to the buyer the following documents and how, either in hard copy or in electronic format. I've had five, at least five different instances where I've even had to talk to other brokers about this, like, well, we gave your people a link. Mm, that's not what's required in the contract. You're required to provide me the documents. When it says in electronic format, that doesn't mean link. That means like a PDF, right? So, and yes, this ad has actually made it to litigation stages, not with us, but with some other brokers I know, where it's like, you didn't do your job. This is a requirement of the seller to push the information to the buyer, not here's a link where the buyer can pull the information down to the buyer. Now that seems kind of ticky tack, but it's a real thing. So if you're representing so, a seller, make sure you're 
pushing the documents, not sending them a link, because that does not jump the hurdle of the requirement in Section 7. So if I attach all the CCNRs, minutes, everything like that, to the MLS, still does not count. I have to, I have to literally send another email with all of that same data over to them that shows that I made an effort to provide this information. It comes back to what I just finished with. Is putting it on the MLS a push or a pull mechanism? It's a pull. It's a pull. That's not what the contract says, right? The contract says the seller shall provide. Let me translate for you. Shall deliver to the buyer these things. And here's how it's acceptable. So is it still good practice to put it in the MLS? Yes, I would never discourage you from doing that because, you know, that with other things is going to kind of create a pattern of you weren't hiding anything or anything. But just when we get down to brass tacks, realize the requirement is for your seller to push, provide, deliver these documents to the buyer. Okay. All right. That's what I have for you this week. I hope, you know, your Columbus Day and Columbus holiday week goes exceptionally well. Um, we have... For those who are interested, we have sales meeting in South Ogden on Tuesday, and we have sales meeting on Wednesday in St. George. So we'll be doing that lovely drive down to St. George again. Love it. <laughs> Thank you all for being on the call. We'll catch you next time. At least it's not 125 degrees in St. George anymore. Seriously, isn't that <laughs> the truth? Yeah. All right. Have a good one, everybody. Thanks, Thanks Matt. Matt.